With me in your Bibles, please, to Psalm 62. Psalm 62. We wrapped up a rather extended series on the book of Daniel a couple of Sundays ago. In a, in a few weeks, you can look in your bulletin, you can see in a couple of Sundays from now, we're going to begin a, a new, uh, a shorter series, maybe five weeks or so. I think it's going to be a series titled Gracious and Tolerance how to stand firm in a shift in culture. And I hope that you will plan to be here for that, uh, kind of get past the fall break time and before we start into that a couple of Sundays. And I hope that you'll also consider inviting maybe some others to be a part of that series here with us in what I believe will be a helpful series as we consider how to live in a world that is quickly changing how it handles truth. So today is, I guess, what we call a standalone message. Uh, the title of this morning's message comes from a, a prayer that many of us were taught as we were growing up. Many of us were told to bow our heads and fold our hands and to pray uh, before a meal along these lines. God is great. God is good. Let us thank Him for the food. By His hands we all are fed. Give us, Lord, our daily bread. Amen. Some mom probably instilled a little bit of good theology in her kids when she maybe developed that prayer. And if you want to and you're really, really hungry today after the service, you can use that uh, to go ahead and pass and you can dig right in. How's that sound? All right. Well, God is great. And God is good, but not everyone believes that. I was praying and thinking about what to share with you this morning, what to preach on, and, and to be honest with you, my thoughts kept going back to a movie that I saw a couple of weeks ago, and it was a movie, and the what little bit I saw of it really irritated me. And so, as I thought back about it, I had a little bit of a burr under my saddle as I thought back to some of that movie, and so I'm going to vent about that just a little bit with you this morning. Now, before I tell you the movie and show you the clip, let me uh, just make sure you understand that a lot of times I watch movies that I don't really care for. That's what you do when, when you're married and when you have kids. For instance, I will periodically watch a chick flick that I don't really care for. Usually once in February, around Valentine's Day, I'll watch one of those. In August, around Becky's birthday, I'll watch one of those. Uh, usually when I'm a jerk and get into trouble, I'll watch one of those. I did that uh, 24 years ago. Or was it 24 hours ago? Does that sound a little more uh, reasonable? And then I watch some movies that a 13-year-old boy would like, but I don't necessarily care for. And, and that's what I'm referring to this morning. Now, I didn't see the whole thing. I don't even know exactly what the whole movie is about. I didn't see the beginning. I didn't see the end. But Matthew was watching this movie one day, and I saw a part of it. And so the title of this internationally recognized and critically acclaimed masterpiece is this, Batman versus Superman, Dawn of Justice. So let me just ask, how many of you have seen this movie? Okay, several, especially right down here in the front. Well, let me go ahead and show you the clip that uh, kind of got under my skin. It's Lex Luthor, and he is talking to Superman and he, I think, is seeing Superman as God, or at least a type of God, as an all-powerful being that, in this case, he thinks needs to be brought down a notch. Okay, And so this is only about a minute, but I want you to be listening uh, for something that might not go well with you as, uh, as well. So, Tony, run the clip if you would. Problems up here. Uh, the, the problem of, of evil in the world. Uh, the problem of absolute virtue. I'll take you in without breaking you, which is more than you deserve. The problem of you on top of everything else. You above all. Ah, because that's what God is. Horus, Apollo, Jehovah, 
Cal L. Clark. Joseph. Kent. See, what we call God depends upon our tribe, Clark Joe. Because God is tribal. God takes sides. No man in the sky intervened when I was a boy to deliver me from daddy's fist and abominations. Mm. I figured out way back. If God is all-powerful, he cannot be all-good. And if he is all-good, then he cannot be all-powerful. So there are a lot of crazy thoughts in that little clip there, but the key line, I trust you caught by Lex Luthor, is this. If God is all-powerful, he cannot be all good. And if he is all good, then he cannot be all powerful. He had previously referred to evil. And the thinking is that if God is all powerful and can do whatever he wishes because evil is in this world, then he must not be loving. Or if he can do what he wants to, or he, rather he is loving, then he must not be able to do what he wants to do. He cannot be both because of the presence of evil in this world. Now, you may ask, Bill, why are we uh, discussing a movie clip this morning? And the reason for that is that this has been at least a question, if not an attack on God for thousands of years. And it has certainly proved to be a challenge and a struggle, even for many believers. History's most famous statement of the problem of evil comes from an ancient Greek philosopher by the name of Epicurus. And he lived about 300 years before the time of Christ, and he wrote this, Is God willing to prevent evil, but not able? Then He is not omnipotent. Is He able, but not willing? Then He is malevolent, or evil-minded. Is he both able and willing? Then whence cometh evil? If he is neither able nor willing, then why call him God? Much closer to our time, philosopher H.J. McClowski in his article, The Problem of Evil, describes the situation as follows. The problem of evil is a very simple one to state. There is evil in the world, yet the world is said to be the creation of a good and omnipotent God. How is this possible? Surely a good, omnipotent God would have made a world free of evil of any kind. This so-called problem has been around so long and it's been such a huge topic that theologians actually uh, have a word for it. It is referred to as theosity. Theosity is defined as the defense of of God's goodness and omnipotence in view of the existence of evil. So theosity, the defense of God's goodness and omnipotence in view of the existence of evil. Now you may have never thought along these lines, but believe me, every parent that has lost a child has. Everyone who has been abused or treated terribly in some fashion has. Every family that has lost their home to a hurricane or a tornado or a flood or a fire has. The person who has had significant health issues has. The spouse who has been deserted has. The person that is close to anyone who has experienced any similar things as I just have described has. Anyone that has endured significant heartache in life, anyone who has been hurt deeply has wondered if God cares. And if God does care, then is He capable of doing, or was He capable of doing something on my behalf? I have heard people plead or beg God to do things. I have heard people curse God when He would not or did not. I have seen people turn from God when He did not do what they thought that He could and should do. Now, while I either confirm what you maybe already believe and what you understand from the Word of God, or as I maybe change your thinking, and that's what I'm seeking to do, trying to get you to think things maybe a little differently as we look at the Word of God, as we go into this, this morning and talk about the tragedies of life, Please don't hear me being unsympathetic 
to what you've been through, to the burden that you carry, to the heartache that you wrestle with, maybe day by day. Now, in trying to address this from the pages of Scripture, we should first note that the Bible does, from cover to cover, it does teach us that God is all-powerful. And the Bible also teaches us that God is kind and loving and compassionate and, and full of mercy. So we read Scripture that teaches us those two truths. For example, just a couple, we'll get to Psalm 62 in just a minute, but look on the screens with me. It's Psalm 147, verse 5. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. And when we read in Jeremiah 32, 17, Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. So the Bible teaches clearly about the omnipotence of God. The Bible also talks about the love of God. For instance, 1 John 4.16. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love and he who, ho- he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. And then, what about John 3.16? For God, what? So loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If you believe in the omnipotence and in the love of God, would you say amen? amen? The Bible teaches both of these. And then there are passages that teach both of these truths together at the same time. Just one of these I want us to take a look at in Psalm 62. But because this is such a great psalm, I didn't really realize or forgotten that this is uh, one of my wife's or maybe my wife's favorite psalm. So because it's such a great psalm and because it's really not that long, I want us to read all of it so that we can better appreciate the context of this truth that God is both. So start with me, if you would, in Psalm 62. Look with me in verse 1. Truly my soul silently waits for God. From Him comes my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. This psalm is about trusting God while being wrongfully attacked by others, by other people. This is about trusting God and God alone. That's what this is about. Trusting God and God alone. And it's about why we only need to trust in God. Now, this may or may not have been written by King David. If you read through all 150 Psalms, you'll find that there are a number of them by David from when he was running from Saul and his army, or there are some when he's running from Absalom, his son, who led in an uh, an uprising against him. And so there are a number of psalms that are about David looking to God, praying for God to deliver him, to protect him, to be his strength, his high tower, his fortress, all of that. We don't, are not told that this was from David, but it's similar. It, it may be from David, or it may be from Solomon. It may be from another king. It talks about being in a lofty position. So it seems to be from a king, maybe David, who is uh, dealing with enemies coming after him. He continues, verse 3, How long will you attack a man? You shall be slain, all of you, like a leaning wall and a tottering fence. They only consult to cast him down from his high position. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. And so he's being attacked. This is someone who's being attacked without cause. You ever been attacked without cause? Made me think a lot this week watching some of the Senate hearings, wondering the whole story with that. It made me reflect back on times in my life, and I'm sure all of us at some time or another have felt attacked without cause. And so in light of that, he echoes what he said in the first two verses. Go with me to verse 5. And notice again the, the sense of God only or God alone. My soul, wait silently For God alone, for my expectation is from Him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. 
In God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength. And my refuge is in God. Trust in Him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. Amen? God is a refuge for us. And so the writer is working his way to telling us to be trusting in God and God only, but then why we only need to trust in God. But before he gets to that final point, he's going to remind us that we have the tendency, do we not, to trust in other things. We all have that propensity to to kind of hold out before we finally go to God. And so he talks about that. Look with me in verse 9. Surely men of low degree are a vapor. Men of high degree are a lie. If they are weighed on the scales, they are altogether lighter than vapor. Do not trust in oppression nor vainly hope in robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. What's he saying? Here in verse 9, what he's saying is that people are going to let you down. People are going to let you down. Even your sweet, godly grandmother, at the end of the day, she cannot come through for you. Your mom, your dad, your husband, your wife, nobody in comparison to God can come through for you like you need them to. And then he talks about oppression in the beginning of verse uh, 10. Don't trust in your ability to control things. You're not going to be able to suppress your enemies. You're not going to stop the uprising. You cannot handle it all by yourself. And then he talks about wealth or riches. You can't trust in your possessions. All of that is going to let you down. And so we must be careful about what we put our confidence in. Everything on this earth proves to be unreliable. Becky, back maybe the beginning of the year, bought a blood pressure cuff. And I saw it laying there one day, and so uh, I decided to check my blood pressure. And I took my blood pressure, and it was like 150-something over like 100. Now, I've never had high blood pressure. And I have high cholesterol, I have high creatinine, which I'm having checked out. I've got low stuff that's none of your business. I've got highs and lows. <laughs> but, but my blood pressure's always been right on 120 over 80. And so I had my yearly physical, like in March. I go in, and she checks my blood pressure, and it's 120 over 80. Now, most people's goes up when they go to the doctor, you know? Get anxious about having your physical and being told how overweight you are and all that kind of stuff. And so I had a follow-up visit for some stuff several weeks later, and so I take this blood pressure cuff with me. And I go in, I say, I want to check this thing out. I put it on, rang it up, 155 over 102. So the nurse checks my blood pressure, 122 over 81. And I said, somebody ain't right here, okay? So she goes and gets a PA, a physician's assistant. He comes in, 121 over 82. The stupid blood pressure cuff was wrong. It was unreliable. I was stressed out. I told Becky, it's it's no wonder that my blood pressure didn't go high because I was so stressed out over having high blood pressure when I didn't really have it. You can't rely on very much on this earth, folks. And reliability is invaluable. Reliability is absolutely invaluable. And you'll really believe that when you've got enemies coming at you for no reason. And so the psalmist is saying, don't trust in people. And don't trust in your ability to control things and suppress them. And don't trust in your pocketbook or your checkbook. All of those things collectively are going to let you down. You need to do what? Trust in God. Amen? Trust in God. Well, why? Why just trust in God? Well, he's going to tell us. Look at verse 11. God has spoken once. Twice I have heard this. This is just another way of saying that God has stated this and He has made this very clear. 
There's no doubt about the fact that what? That power belongs to God. Power belongs to God. He can do whatever He wants to do. Nothing is too hard for God. But verse 11, also, also to you, O Lord, belongs mercy. Some of your versions have unfailing love, kessed, the never-ending, sacrificial, unfailing love of God Almighty on your behalf. To you, O Lord, belongs power and also belongs mercy, for to you, for you render to each one according to his work. You see, at the end of the day, God always has been and always will be just. He has always been, He always will be just. Righteousness will prevail. It may not always seem that way to us. It may be God settling the score, so to speak, as we put it on the other side of the grave, but He will always deal with us ultimately with justice. Abraham asked the question, just before the destruction of, of Sodom and Gomorrah, he asked the Lord because he was struggling with the fairness of all that was coming down at that time. And he asked in Genesis 18.25, Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? The answer to that is what? A profound yes. Yes, the judge of all the earth will always do that which is right. It is unfortunate that some have come to the conclusion that an all-powerful and all-loving God cannot exist because evil exists. They conclude that an all-powerful and all-loving God could not and would not allow evil, therefore no such God exists because evil does exist. But those of us who know Christ see things differently. Amen? Amen? Those of us who know Christ see things differently. We grow in our understanding that the Bible teaches truth about the character of God. We come to understand that this book is reliable and that we can trust and believe. And over time as we walk with Christ, we come to see that the truths about the character of God are not inconsistent with our own personal experiences. Amen? It all lines up when we understand who God is, His character, what the Bible teaches about that. And when we see our experiences in the light of the truth of the Word of God, it all lines up. Part of us seeing things differently is the Scripture that we've just talked about. Scripture that teaches that God is all-powerful. Scripture that teaches that God is all-loving. Scripture that does, like Psalm 62, puts those two concepts together. Part of us who know Christ seeing things differently, it's other Scripture. Scripture like Romans 8.28 which states, and we, all, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. We become maybe a little too overly familiar with that verse, but it's true. There's profound truth there. There's comfort there. That God is at work and He is at work for good in the lives of His people. And then, those of us who know Christ see things differently because of all the biblical examples that we see in the Word of God. Examples like Job. Example of Job teaches us that God will take the godliest of people and even go deeper in their experience of God, reveal Himself in an even greater, deeper way with, with all of us, but even the godliest of people. There are examples like Esther. We see evil in that story. Someone like Haman, and yet God is using that to orchestrate events for the betterment of His people. And, and we've just seen that laid out so clearly, most of us in our Sunday school classes as we've gone through the study of Joseph. And we've seen that evil was intended, and yet God was orchestrating all of that for the good of His people. One of the things I liked about that study is that we would periodically talk about the series of coincidences 
It just so happened that there was a caravan going by that day that the brothers attacked Joseph. It just so happened that they were going to Egypt. It just so happened that Potiphar was buying a slave that day. It just so happened that his wife was a lying you-know-what. It it just so happened that a famine drives his brothers down to Egypt after he's been elevated to prime minister. All these series of things, all of it teaching us the lesson so, so clearly in the book of Genesis and the life of Joseph is that evil was intended. Without doubt, evil was intended, but God rose above all that, orchestrated all that, used all of that for the betterment of His people. Amen? That's what's going on. So there is Scripture that talks about God being all-powerful. There is Scripture that talks about the love of God. There is Scripture that talks about both. There is Scripture like Romans 8.28. There is Scripture like the examples of Job and Esther and Joseph and David and Naomi and Ruth and Daniel and Jeremiah and on and on we could go. And finally, there is Scripture number four. There's Scripture that teaches us a very important lesson that we have a hard time letting sink in. So what are you you talking about there? Scripture like Isaiah 55 and verse 8, if you'll read that with me. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Okay? Let me illustrate this. There's a man by the name of William... Austin, who I think gives a great example, and I'll kind of play this out with you. Colton, come up here with me for a minute. I'm going to, I need a volunteer. And so, you don't have to say a whole lot here, but I just need come, someone to kind of interact with and have a conversation with. And so, um, I am flying out in the morning uh, to New York City. There is a conference, a symposium. It's the greatest scientist around the world. And they're meeting to have a conference uh, in quantum physics. Okay? Now, does that surprise you at all that I would be going to such a thing? I'll plead the fifth. You'll plead the fifth. Okay. Okay. (laughs) Now, you may be wondering why I am going to such a conference. Well, they are proposing a, a new theory on quantum physics. Okay? It doesn't answer your question, does it? Why I'm going. Well... I am going because I don't agree with the new theory. I've read the theory, and I don't understand it. I can't make sense of it, okay? I can't quite get my head around it. And so I am going to communicate to them that I disagree with it, that it's wrong because I don't understand it. Would you explain to me how something could be right that I don't understand? Okay, have, have, a, have, a, have a seat. Thanks, okay? okay? There's all kinds of stuff that is true that we don't understand, right? I, I really don't understand electricity, but the lights are on. I, I really don't understand how my phone can do, be as smart as it is. There, there's tons of stuff I just don't get. And so... Austin says this, the point is that we are not in a position to assume that if an infinite God has reasons for allowing evil, then we as finite and fallible beings should be able to figure them out. Who do we think we are? In other words, we are way too quick to get way too big for our britches and speak into things that we know virtually nothing about. That's the problem that we have, folks. We see only a fraction of really what is going on, and we are not that smart to try to make sense of what little bit that we do see. And so someone may say, but Bill, God could have stopped Hurricane Florence from happening or the tsunami that hit just, what, in the last 24 hours. Yeah, He could have stopped that. Do you know how many people are are coming to Christ through that disaster? Well, I don't know either. But I know of reports out of the Caribbean where Hurricane Irma hit last year 
of scores and scores of people coming to know Christ. I know the year before that when the earthquake hit in Ecuador because we had missionaries there, I know of scores and scores of people that came to know Christ. And I know before that there was an earthquake in Chile and I know missionaries there. I know scores and scores of people came to know Christ through that. I know about the earthquake in Haiti because I've been there and have talked to people and scores and scores of people came to know Christ through that. And we could back up to New Orleans, we could go all over the place. And you say, but Bill... People died in those disasters. I understand that. So let me get this right. You know how to better manage the lifespan of 7 billion people better than God does? Is that what you're saying? Well, no, you just want to manage a handful. God is managing the birth and the death of 7 billion people at once. And yes, people die. And yes, God uses the death of people to stir the hearts of other people. He's done that throughout history. That's what God does. He limits our days, He numbers our days, and He uses the death of people to stir the hearts of other people to draw them to Himself. You say, but Bill, something happened to me or to my loved one that was just evil, and for the life of me, I can't see the good in it. Don't sell God short. Don't sell God short. I, in my lifetime, in my short little lifetime, have seen repeatedly, I have seen over and over and over, I have seen the mess that either people make or that they just find themselves in to no, no fault of their own, and I have repeatedly seen God bring good out of one mess after another, after another, as only a loving and omnipotent God can do. That's who God is. That's what He does. Don't sell Him short. Amen? Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who suffered for years in a Russian labor camp, a, a, a gutlog, wrote this, Bless you, prison. Bless you for being in my life. For there, lying upon the rotting prison straw, I came to realize that the object of life is not prosperity, as we are made to believe, but the maturity of the human soul. Let me end with a couple of brief points. Two points, I think, that are relevant to this discussion. Here's the first one. Number one, while God has allowed evil to exist, He has not kept Himself from being touched by it. While God has allowed evil to exist, He has not kept Himself from being touched by it. No greater evil has ever occurred on the face of the earth as when Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was mocked and slapped and beaten, scourged, brutally whipped, and nailed to an old rugged cross. John Stott in The Cross of Christ writes, The God I worship is that lonely, twisted, tortured figure on the cross. Nails through his hands and feet, back lacerated, limbs wrenched, brow ble ble bleeding from thorn pricks, mouth dry and intolerably thirsty, plunged in God-forsaken darkness. That is the God for me. He laid aside his immunity to pain. He entered our world of flesh and blood, tears and death. He suffered for us. There is still a question mark against human suffering, but over it we stamp another mark, the cross, which symbolizes divine suffering. Isn't that good? So my first final point is that God has allowed evil to exist, but he has not kept himself from being touched by it. And my second and concluding Final point is this, second, all evil in the hurt that it brings will end one day. Amen? Amen? It will end one day. As believers are entering the heavenly city, as we are going into the new Jerusalem, it is prophesied that a loud voice from heaven will be heard saying this, from Revelation 21.4, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, 
for the former things have passed away. All tears will be wiped away, as will be everything that brings those tears. J. Sklar's professor of Old Testament theology at Covenant Theological Seminary, and he talks about how evil can take on many forms. And then he writes this, but one of them is unique. Death is the only one that can never be avoided. People may be brought out of poverty. Wars and abuses may end. Relational pain can be healed. But death is unavoidable. It is the strongest expression of evil there is. No one has ultimately defeated it except Jesus. The Scripture teaches that God not only suffered and died on our behalf, He also came to life again and defeated death itself, which means this. If He can defeat the strongest of evils, then He can defeat all the rest. Amen? Amen. Well, I think that's a pretty good note to end on. We have a God who has endured the worst of evil on the cross of Calvary. And now He's preparing a place for us to go to. A place where there will be no more pain. There will not be any evil. There won't be anything ungodly. There won't be anything that hurts. And He'll take all that away and leave only that which is good and right and pure and which brings joy and peace. If you long for that blessed day, would you say amen? amen. Would you pray with me? Alan's going to come with a song of invitation, and I want to invite you this morning to, to think through what we've just talked about. And I want to ask you the question, is this something that maybe you've wrestled with? Or maybe you're wrestling with this morning? So let me ask you, are you ready to trust God with it. Maybe there's still some confusion. Maybe there's still pain. Maybe there's still anxiety. Maybe there's still a struggle of forgiveness. Maybe there are wounds that still go deep. Are you willing to trust God with all of that? Are you willing to trust Him with tomorrow? Are you willing to just to take all of that and to trust what God says about the character of God, that He is omnipotent and that He has a heart of love for you. Are you willing to believe this morning that everything that He has ever done towards you has been an act of love? Are you willing to believe that there's nothing that has ever happened to you that He could have stopped that He didn't stop, but it's all because He loves you. He cares for you. He wants what's best for you. And He is weaving together the story of your life and He knows what He is doing. Will you trust Him with that? I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet with me with heads bowed. Father, we want to commit this time to You. Father, if there's hesitation about believing one or the other about who you are. May you help us just to settle that now. Lord, if there's hesitation about trusting you in any form or fashion with our today or our tomorrow or our eternal destiny, may we, Father, hand that to you right now. I'm going to invite you just to keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. And maybe you want to spend a, a minute at the altar this morning just saying, Lord, I trust you. I trust you with my confusion. I trust you with my past. I trust you with my future. Lord, you are worthy to be trusted. I rest in you. I rest in you. I want someone to pray with you. I'd be glad to do so. But why don't you pray that through, either where you stand or at the altar this morning, as Alan leads.